All right, uh, welcome back. Let us continue with our derivation and explanation of Feynman rules and Feynman diagrams. Here uh, we are just in the middle of computing and analyzing the Feynman diagrams for so-called Compton scattering in QED at three level. And for this important process, there are two Feynman diagrams which look like this. Compton scattering is the process where we have electron photon scattering. So one incoming electron and one incoming photon and also one in, uh, outgoing electron and photon. And in perturbation theory, this process is described in um, uh, this way that you have three um, states for the initial state and the final state. And the initial and final states can be described by creation and annihilation operators of the free particles acting onto the vacuum. Therefore, the incoming state is described in this way with free creation operators acting onto the vacuum corresponding to the incoming electron and photon. And the final state is described like this with annihilation operators acting onto the vacuum to the left. And uh, in between these three states for the external particles, we have the S operator in perturbation theory, which is the time ordered exponential of I times the interaction Lagrangian uh, density integrated over space time. And so in perturbation theory, we expand this exponential function order by order. And uh, for this three level Feynman diagram, we need second order in the interaction Lagrangian, which gives us two vertices. So two vertices correspond to two powers of the interaction Lagrangian in the exponential. And therefore, the corresponding matrix element that you have to evaluate is this one. We have one over two factorial from the exponential function and initial and final state and in between time ordered product of two powers of uh, the space time integral of the interaction Lagrangian density times i. And the interaction Lagrangian density for QED is minus EQ times psi bar gamma mu psi a mu. It's a gauge invariant Lagrangian. And this is the interaction term coupling the photon to the electron in a Lorentz invariant way. And the i here comes, uh, as I said, because we have e to the i times this integral. Okay, and then we have analyzed that one has to evaluate such expectation values by so-called contractions. The simple idea and the simple observation is that uh, you get non-zero contributions only if you have a pair of uh, corresponding creation and annihilation operators. Whenever there is a creation or annihilation operator which is not paired with another one, then ultimately it acts onto the vacuum and gives zero. Therefore, the only contributions which are non-zero come from such pairs and uh, they are, can all be evaluated by commutators between the corresponding operators. And so um, you can graphically visualize the contractions and these pairings which can appear. And so, for example, you can single out one such uh, annihilation operator and uh, ask yourself which commutators are non-zero um, before uh, the B2 operator acts here onto the vacuum and gives zero. And so there is one non-vanishing commutator between B2 and psi bar here. And another non-vanishing commutator would be between B2 and the other psi bar over there. And uh, so then this is one non-vanishing term in the final expression. And you go through all the operators in the same way. And then you end up with so-called full or complete contractions where every operator is contracted with exactly one other one. And so here in this case, uh, we have a contraction which corresponds exactly to this Feynman diagram. We are um, okay, starting from the left, maybe. The incoming particles with index one couple to the vertex at x2. So we have, we have a contraction between b1 dagger and psi2 and a1 dagger and a2. So this corresponds to these two lines coupling to that vertex here. Then we have a contraction between the points, the vertices two and one that corresponds to the contraction between psi1 and psi2 bar. 
Then uh, the other outgoing lines with index two coupled to the vertex at position one. So that is described by this contraction here between the electron and psi one bar and the photon and A1 mu. So we have a full contraction corresponding to this Feynman diagram. And there are a few other full contractions like this where uh, some uh, fields are exchanged. And in particular, there are those ones which uh, are identical up to the renaming of the two vertices x1 and x2. They give rise to identical looking Feynman diagram except that the integration variable names are exchanged. But there is another one which gives rise to a different Feynman diagram, namely this one, and uh, that must be computed as well. But let us now, so that was the point where we stopped last time, and let us now go on because we have actually not yet completely analyzed the Feynman diagram, and we have not yet completely verified that the rules I stated in the beginning are actually true. So, uh, and therefore there are a few remaining steps that we should take now. And we do these steps exactly only for this particular contraction, not for all the other ones, but uh, for the one that I have written down, which was also the first one that we wrote down the last time. All right, namely what we now have to do is to insert the mathematical expressions for all the quantities, for all the contractions which appear here. So let me do this on the other blackboard. Or maybe let us begin here. So, so we can immediately for this first contraction so we have an equation first contraction is uh, equal to this Feynman diagram where we have specifically the two variables x1, x2 like this. And the rules are now coming from literally evaluating the operator expression at the top. So we have already done the basic work. Namely, let us begin. First of all, we have the one over two factorial. We have the two integrals and we have the two factors minus i e q square because for each vertex we get such a factor. And then we have the operator expressions. All the rest are operators. And now we have the different contractions. Let us begin. The first contraction is the one for the outgoing electron. And remember that uh, the Dirac structure matters. So uh, that psi bar here is a spinor, which is a four component quantity, which appears to the left of the gamma matrix, which is a four by four matrix. So we have to retain this uh, matrix multiplication structure. Therefore, the contraction between those two is a number valued four component object. And what was it? It was the spinor U bar corresponding to um, the variables uh, of this outgoing electron, P2 and S2, the momentum and spin of the outgoing electron. So that is literally the result of evaluating this commutator, which is symbolized by the contraction. Then next we have the gamma matrix, gamma mu. Next we have this object here, psi 1, psi 2. And that is now uh, this time ordered vacuum expectation value like this uh, that corresponds to the contraction between these two field operators. This is the so-called propagator which I've uh, also written down here to remind you. Then in the Dirac structure we can go on. Then this is multiplied with gamma nu. And uh, next there is the contraction between the incoming electron and uh, this field psi 2, and that is the spin or u with a variable p1, s1 for the incoming electron. Then we have uh, the photon contractions. So here the photon contraction. So this goes on times 
the photon contraction for the outgoing photon gives a polarization vector epsilon mu star complex conjugated with a variable for the outgoing photon k2 lambda 2 momentum and spin of the outgoing photon. Then uh, for the incoming photon we have epsilon nu without star k1 lambda 1 with those variables. These are all the quantities and you see that the Lorentz indices uh, match precisely. But I have ignored one thing which we now need to uh, write here at the, at the end. Namely all the contractions actually were not equal to those spinors and epsilons but there was an exponential function as well. There was an exponential function and the exponential function had a structure, a systematic structure. Namely it was always like this that whenever you have an outgoing particle you get e to the plus i momentum times uh, the position of that field. If you have an incoming particle you get e to the minus i times the momentum times the position of the field. And so we can summarize all the exponential functions in uh, one and then we have e to the plus i times the outgoing momentum. So we have outgoing momentum of the electron which is p2 and of the photon k2 times x1. These are the two exponentials because somehow in the way the contractions were set up uh, the outgoing particles were coupled to the x1 vertex and then minus i times the same for the incoming. So we have p1 plus k1 times x2. These are those exponential functions. And that's the end. So that is mathematically exactly the result of evaluating this particular contraction for that matrix element. And similarly you can do it for all the other ones. And now the question is what is the next step? The next step is of course to plug in the value of the propagator and to evaluate the x integrals. And you can sort of guess or maybe you already see that the x integrals are going to be simple because they involve only this exponential function. But uh, before we can do that let us plug in the result for the propagator. The propagator here is in position space with two position arguments x1, x2. And we have calculated that such a propagator is actually a green function for the differential operator of the corresponding Lagrangian. So Dirac differential operator acting on this gives a delta function in position space. And so if you do a Fourier transformation in four dimensions of the propagator, then the Fourier transformed propagator is just the inverse of the Fourier transform differential operator which is q slash minus m. And so that is what we symbolize by such a line, the Fourier transformed uh, propagator. And so let us plug in for this position space object the Fourier uh, notation. So we have a momentum integral, an exponential function and uh, the Fourier propagator. So plug in propagator. then we get 1 over 2 factorial d4x d4x2 integrals minus ieq square times u uh, let's abbreviate it u2 bar gamma mu then we have the propagator i divided by q slash minus m gamma nu u1 epsilon star mu uh, 2 and epsilon without star 1 nu. And now the exponential function uh, and actually here we also have a momentum integral d4q divided by 2 pi to the fourth. And the exponential function has an additional term. The exponential function has now the additional term from the Fourier transformation of the propagator and uh, the Fourier transformation depends on x1 and x2 so we can distribute it in the appropriate way. So we have uh, e to the plus i times p2 plus k2 
times x1, and now at x1 there is also minus q now appearing. So we have this combination appearing uh, in the exponential function with x1. And then we have minus i p1 plus k1, uh, k1. And uh, at x2 we also have minus q, minus q times x2. Okay. So and you see that the propagator also follows the same rule. Um, the incoming momentum uh, at the momentum flows from position two to position one, from two to one. So the momentum Q is incoming at position one, and there you have e to the minus i Q x one. And uh, Q is outgoing from x two, and x two you have e to the plus i Q x two. So it's always the same rule for incoming and outgoing momentum. And so here you have now an exponential function which depends on x1. And what is the prefactor of x1? It's the sum of the three incoming momenta at x1. Namely, at uh, the momentum q flows from 2 to 1. So q flows in this direction, in this Fourier transformation. And uh, the momentum p1 and k1, they are incoming. q is outgoing out of the vertex and therefore this is the sum of the three incoming momenta at the vertex one. And similarly, uh, at vertex two, you have the same thing. Okay. So automatically, uh, the, we get exponential functions which correspond to the total sum of the momenta at each vertex. And therefore, now we can look at the integrals. What happens with the integrals? They all collapse and become very simple, namely, the integral at x1 and x2 is only an integral over the exponential function. And uh, the exponential function depends on the sum of the three incoming momenta at the corresponding vertex. The result of the integral will give a delta function, a delta function of exactly those combinations of momenta. And that corresponds physically to momentum conservation at the vertex x1. Similarly, the integral over x2 gives a delta function for the sum of the incoming momenta at x2 and it enforces momentum conservation at the vertex x2. So, and you can generalize this. It's not an um, uh, accident for this Feynman diagram, but it appears for all Feynman diagrams that the integrals over the positions of the vertices gives rise to momentum conservation at the vertex because of those exponential functions. So let's write this down. The integral over d4x1 and d4x2, they give rise to the following, 2 pi to the 4 delta function of the sum of the incoming momenta at the two vertices. This means we have four momentum conservation at each vertex. That is enforced by the delta functions. And after we have done that, we can also easily evaluate the integral over the momentum q. There is the Fourier integral over the momentum flowing through the propagator q. And this is now simple because of the delta functions. So if you have this integral over q and you see this delta function, then the integral collapses. And the result is that q is simply replaced by whatever it is here coming from the delta function. And q is replaced by that everywhere else in the expression. So d4q divided by 2 pi to the 4. And also the 2 pi to the 4 cancels nicely against one of these factors from the delta function. Collapses. And Q replaced by um, its value coming from momentum conservation.
So here, Q can be replaced by P2 plus K2 or by P1 plus K1, depending on which delta function you look at. After you've done the replacement, so let's say you consider this delta function, then you do the Q integration, then Q is replaced by P2 plus K2, and everywhere else you must replace Q by that sum. So that means the second delta function changes and becomes a delta function of P1 plus K1 minus P2 minus K2. That is a delta function corresponding to overall momentum conservation of the process. In either case, this remains. And remember that we already claimed that uh, S matrix elements will always involve exactly such a factor. And we have defined the so-called T matrix, which is uh, the rest, the interesting part of the S matrix when we um, factor out the delta function. And now you see that explicitly from the calculation, the delta function has arisen. And uh, therefore, everything else, which is not this delta function, would be what we call the T matrix element, which is the physically interesting part of the result. So Q does not only appear in the delta function, however, Q also appears elsewhere. Namely, where does it appear? It appears here in this uh, result for the propagator. And so here in this propagator Feynman rule, Q will now be replaced by uh, the correct value coming from momentum conservation, either this or that, which is however the same because of overall momentum conservation. So, therefore, we have completely evaluated everything uh, the last remark is this, that the factor 1 over 2 factorial will cancel when we add the contraction where x1 and x2 are interchanged. We already said it. And then we can write down the complete result of those Feynman diagrams. And this is what I will do next. So, up to the factor 2 pi to the 4 times the delta function, we get the following result. This Feynman diagram, which came from the contraction from above, including the contraction where the two vertices are interchanged because we cannot distinguish them anymore from looking at the Feynman diagram. So the result of this Feynman diagram is literally what we have now calculated except for the delta function and except for the factor one half. And the result is therefore um, the top line where the exponential functions is completely gone, all the integrals are gone, and Q is replaced by momentum conservation. So we have then U bar of P2 S2 times, let me combine it in this way, minus i e q gamma mu times, what was it, uh, i divided by p1 slash plus k1 slash minus m, then minus i e q gamma nu uh, times u of p1 s1 
and then times the two epsilons. Epsilon star mu, k2 lambda 2, and epsilon u, k1 lambda 1. That's it. That is the exact result of this first Feynman diagram. Including all the factors and the result corresponds to i times tfi for this um, diagram. Okay. And if you do the same for the other Feynman diagram, then you would get the full uh, i times tfi result. And so maybe we can just do that for completeness by applying the Feynman rules. So similarly, what would we get when we go through the identical procedure for this contraction here? When we go through the same procedure for the other contraction, then of course, uh, what happened here for the exponential functions will also happen for the other Feynman diagram. Um, so all the integrals will cancel. We will get an overall delta function corresponding to momenta conser momentum conservation. And at each vertex, momentum is also conserved. And momentum conservation at each vertex means now that our Q running through the propagator from left to right is uh, different from that Q. Here, momentum conservation tells us the following. We have incoming P1 and outgoing K2 at this vertex. And Q flows from left to right. And therefore, momentum conservation tells us that Q must be equal to P1 minus K2. Right? That is the result from momentum conservation. And it's also the same as you could also look at momentum conservation at the other vertex, where there is um, incoming k1 and outgoing p2. So then uh, q must be equal to p2 minus k1. So and this is consistent because of overall momentum conservation. So and then the result for this diagram is uh, u bar for the outgoing electron, then uh, the vertex minus i e q gamma mu, then the propagator i divided by now p1 slash minus k2 slash minus m. Okay, so that is a difference. Then minus i e q gamma nu, u for the incoming electron. And now we have to uh, look precisely at the epsilons. So gamma mu, the index mu, is the index which sits at the vertex coupling to the outgoing electron. So that is the vertex here. This mu sits at this vertex. So which photon couples to that vertex? It is the incoming photon with momentum k1. Therefore the incoming photon has now epsilon mu k1 lambda 1. And that mu is the same mu as this one in the uh, first vertex. Then the second vertex is the one with the incoming, uh, incoming electron. So that is uh, this one. And it couples to the outgoing photon epsilon star and u k2 lambda 2. And then we have completely evaluated the two Feynman diagrams. And uh, the second result is i times tfi for that diagram. And the full i times tfi for Compton scattering at three level is exactly the sum of these two terms. So do you have any questions to this? Yes, please. So 
Yes, uh, so just to repeat this question also for the video indeed, uh, what I say is that these two Feynman diagrams give the complete result for Compton scattering at three level, but this is only true if the momenta of the initial and final state are different, such that those disconnected kind of diagrams are zero. In principle, there could be such disconnected diagrams where an electron goes directly from the initial state into a final state or the photon as well. And the two vertices do something like that, as we discussed in the exercise. So such a contraction in principle exists mathematically, but it's only non-zero if all the momenta are um, not changed. And that is not a physically interesting situation. So whenever the momenta are changed, then this situation is zero. And uh, the statement that this is the full result is correct. Other questions? It has to do with it, yes. Uh, definitely, I mean, uh, because of translational invariance, we can integrate over uh, the interaction Lagrangian, and the interaction Lagrangian does not depend on space, except for uh, via the field operators. And uh, this is the cause that uh, the only x dependence in the end is in the exponential function. And for that reason, we obtain the delta functions from the integrals. And the delta functions are a reflection of translational invariance. Yes. So if one would modify the Lagrangian, for example, by a term like this. So L int uh, is, for example, psi bar of x gamma mu psi of x a mu of x times times g of x, where g of x is some function, so-called form factor or any function of x, then you have artificially made your interaction Lagrangian not translationally invariant. And then the interaction strength depends on x. So maybe you say that uh, g of x is like a space-dependent coupling constant, which goes to zero at infinity, is even conceivably of interest. But uh, then, of course, you have broken translation and invariance. And in this case, uh, the x dependence will not be just exponential functions, and you will not get, get delta functions from uh, the x integrals, but you will uh, get terms which involve the Fourier transformation of this uh, form factor function here. And so in our case, we have implemented explicitly translational invariance, and this is then manifest at each vertex in this construction. Yeah, 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 it does. It breaks momentum conservation and uh, because it breaks translational invariance. So you, I mean, this uh, form factor, if, if you have uh, some physical origin, it's like an external potential which can uh, provide energy or momentum to the system. Other questions? Okay. Um, how many more examples of that kind should we do? Uh, the options are zero or one. We will, do, uh, we will continue to solve the exercise sheet where we have similar discussions. And so maybe I think we have done ex enough examples here in the lecture, unless you want me to do another one. It seems not so. So let us uh, jump to the conclusion. Then the rest of the lecture would be probably about a summary of Feynman rules. Collect them in nice ways and uh, such that you can really go back to a list of rules later on. Because now our examples basically uh, allow to read off the general case. So let us take all our examples that we have discussed and summarize the rules. I stated uh, one or two lectures ago the Feynman rules for QED. 
and our examples have shown that the rules are correct. And so I will not repeat them here, but we have verified the rules by the explicit cases. But by going through the examples, we have also identified that there are actually some additional rules, which I now want to summarize as well. So first of all, you have seen this factor 1 over n factorial from the exponential function. From the e to the i l int from uh, this term usually drops out. And uh, in our example, it drops out. Also in the example in the, in the exercise, it also dropped out, but it does not always drop out. So sometimes uh, it simply remains or uh, it remains partially because it's only partially canceled. Sometimes they remain uncancelled symmetry factors. And this is then the term uh, how we denote those uncancelled factors. They are called symmetry factors. And they simply arise from the fact that uh, sometimes it happens that if you exchange x1 and x2, you do not actually get a different contraction on the operator level, but you get the identical contraction. And we have actually seen an example in the exercise, namely this one. We have seen this example in the exercise. This is a vacuum diagram. And uh, in this vacuum diagram, all the lines from x1 and x2 are contracted. So if you now exchange the variables x1 and x2, the operator contraction is exactly the same. So it's not uh, only mathematically equal, but it's the identical contraction. Therefore, in this case, the factor 1 over 2 factorial is not cancelled by two different contractions. And so here, this diagram would involve an explicit factor 1 half which you must not forget when calculating the Feynman diagram. And this can sometimes happen. And uh, whether it happens or not, you have to figure out by looking at the diagram and imagining the underlying contractions. Of course, there are computer programs and algorithms to do it in general, but uh, that is the basic principle. Similarly, uh, it has not uh, encountered in our example, but sometimes there are minus signs. See exercise. And the simple uh, physical reason for those minus signs is, of course, Fermi statistics. So if you have a diagram, uh, for example, with two electrons in the final state, then uh, the state is antisymmetric under exchange of the two electrons. And therefore, some Feynman diagrams which correspond to such an exchange of two electrons, they must involve a relative minus sign. And that automatically comes out from the contractions by evaluating the anti-commutators appropriately. So um, always the contractions are the basic um, um, tool to get a correct result. And uh, if you translate them into Feynman diagrams, you have to watch out for those subtle details. Then uh, there is also a rule which we found for the fermions uh, and the lines, namely The Feynman rules for the fermions, they are spinor valued objects. So uh, you must um, treat carefully the matrix structure. You have four component objects or four by four matrices. So the order of the objects matter. They are not only numbers. And the rule is um, that the order of the quantity is against the arrow on the fermion lines. That is the simple rule which we have seen in our examples both now for Compton scattering and also in a previous example some lectures ago. And actually, let me also state here 
this works for QED, but it's also not something that works in all cases. There are quantum field theories where the rule is too simplistic and the simple example is if you have neutral fermions which could be uh, equal to their uh, own antiparticles. Then the arrow on the line is not defined and uh, then you can write down Feynman diagrams where for example arrows clash and so on and then you do not know what to do and so what is then the correct thing to do is of course again to go back to the original contractions. So always correct go back to the original contractions. So this is always the way to obtain the correct result unambiguously with all signs and with all factors. And uh, so that is the definition. Okay, but these are the additional rules that we have found and there is one remaining rule, namely at higher orders there can appear so-called loops in Feynman diagrams. For example, um, something like this can happen or for a Compton scattering, something like that could appear such Feynman diagrams. They have a, a higher number of vertices and therefore they are of higher order in perturbation theory and they involve this uh, so-called loops. In the loops, if you ask for momentum conservation at each vertex, the momentum in the loop is not defined. And um, for example, here you might have a momentum Q flowing through the photon and then you have here a momentum, for example, Q plus K and flowing in this direction and another momentum K flowing in the backward direction and so for any value of K you have momentum conservation at each vertex. Therefore, k is not defined. q plus k is defined, but uh, the k value itself is undefined. Um, it can have an arbitrary value. And if you follow the derivation, then uh, in the beginning there used to be an integral over each momentum of each propagator, right? And so here you would have initially two momentum integrals but also uh, integrals over all the momentum conservation at each vertex. So the, the, you get a delta function for momentum conservation at each vertex and that will cancel some of the momentum integrals from the propagators. But in this case the momentum integral over k remains because k is not defined by these delta functions and therefore in those cases uh, integrals over the undefined momentum our uh, momenta remain over undefined uh, momenta and they are d4k over 2 pi to the fourth power, they remain. And so from this rule you could immediately write down the uh, value for the Feynman diagrams as you literally write down all the factors in the way that we know and uh, here momentum conservation tells you to put some undefined momentum k here, you integrate over k and that is exactly the correct result following from our derivation. Okay, good, that is all I wanted to say to QED. Further questions about QED? So at this point maybe I want to refer you to the discussion that we had at the beginning of this section on Feynman diagrams. Namely I uh, stated that we will do it here quite briefly 
because this semester is devoted to uh, the physics of spin one half, spin one, and the differences between the different spins and the different types of fields. And the derivation of Feynman rules is independent of those uh, differences. And therefore, we are quite brief and much more brief than we were three years ago. And so now you have seen the brief derivation, and I've explained to you, and it's still on video, of course, all the relationships to the derivation from three years ago. And so uh, I invite you to watch those videos and uh, get all the other details of derivations of Feynman diagrams, more examples, and also uh, subtleties in the derivations and so on. But uh, I will not talk more about this here, uh, maybe in the exercise if you ask me, but um, it's public and therefore we can go on here. And what I want to do now, is to generalize the Feynman rules for QED, namely uh, to arbitrary quantum field theories. And then we get a set of rules how you can obtain the Feynman rules for any quantum field theory that you are given. And uh, the field theory is defined by a Lagrangian. And uh, then there is a recipe which uh, you can easily understand from those examples how you get the Feynman rules for any theory. So that will then conclude our chapter on Feynman rules. So this is the summary of the general recipe. So as in the beginning of this section or chapter of the lecture, the Lagrangian of our quantum field theory is defined to be composed out of a free Lagrangian and an interaction Lagrangian. And the free Lagrangian is exactly one of the Lagrangians that we have discussed in chapter two of the lecture, where we know exactly how to quantize it. So this is the combination of Lagrangians of chapter two of the lecture. And uh, the interaction Lagrangian is any Lorentz invariant local combination uh, of fields. And just to be clear, um, also derivatives of fields are allowed in the interactions. So, but local means that uh, the Lagrangian contains only products of fields at the same space-time point and not uh, at different space-time points, but derivatives are allowed. So, then, how do you get the Feynman rules from here? The first thing that you can obtain is the propagators. So, the internal lines in Feynman diagrams. And they come from the free part of the theory, from the free Lagrangian. They uh, really um, correspond to the field quantization and the operators of the free fields uh, with their properties that we have discussed. And so you can always uh, obtain a very simple and beautiful recipe. Namely, you can write the free Lagrangian in this sort of schematic way, uh, either for real or for complex fields. You can write it like this, or up to total derivatives. Okay. So what does that mean? You can always bring the Lagrangian to the form by doing partial integration such that you have a bilinear expression of fields and between the fields you have some differential operator. And this curly D denotes a differential operator. It could be the Klein-Gordon operator box plus m square or it could be the Dirac uh, derivative i d slash minus m and so on. But you can always write the Lagrangian in this form where this is some differential operator. So either of first or second order in derivatives. Then you can define a propagator between fields pij 
would be the vacuum expectation value of uh, two fields, two field operators. Sorry. No. In the complex case, uh, one field has a decker, the other field has no decker. And in the real case, of course, the decker is meaningless. But you can always define a propagator in this way, and it has indices, so you, you get basically a matrix of propagators. So what that, the I means is, of course, the I runs through all the fields of your theory, photon field, electron field, muon field, whatever you have. Uh, it just denotes all the fields, and so here you have a matrix of propagators from any of the fields to any other one. So all of these propagators and uh, so-called two-point functions will of course appear in the contractions uh, when we evaluate the Feynman diagrams in the way as we did. So and then the rule is the same as for QED where the propagator was the inverse of the differential operator. And this is really true also in general. So we, in, we have proven that if you act with a differential operator onto the propagator, you get a delta function in position space. So if you convert to momentum space, then the momentum space propagator is just the inverse of the differential operator where you replace derivatives by momenta. Very simple and nice rule. And so this rule is true in general. Namely, you can say it in the following way, I p tilde i j in momentum space is i times the differential operator Fourier transformed to the minus one with indices i j. Where we again have the rule that i times derivatives go to momenta. So in, then in this way, you can always obtain all propagators of any um, free theory. And the result is of course like this, that in simple cases, if you have only a scalar, one scalar, then you might have a line like this from the Deckard scalar field to the scalar field with momentum Q and the rule is I divided by Q square minus M square plus I epsilon. The I epsilon I have not explained, but let me write it down anyway. Uh, it can be derived in different ways, but uh, if you ignore it, then you have this, and this is the inverse of the Klein-Gordon operator, where you replace the box by minus Q square. Then, um, uh, for the Dirac spinor, Uh, for the Dirac spinor, you have of course the following. So you have psi bar here and psi here, and an arrow from psi bar to psi, which indicates that let's say an electron is created here and an electron is annihilated there. Momentum flows in the direction of the electron, and the propagator is then I divided by Q slash minus M uh, plus I epsilon, which is the same as I times Q slash plus M divided by Q square minus M square plus I epsilon. Again, the inverse of the corresponding operator. And finally, for a photon in covariant gauge with a gauge fixing parameter Xi equal one, we have this propagator just to remind you from a nu to a mu is minus I times G mu nu divided by Q square plus I epsilon. Okay. So this is the type of rules for the different types of propagators that we have. But in general, you have many fields, many scalar fields, many spinor and vector fields, and you might even have mixtures, mixed propagators from one field to another one. And uh, the completely general rule is the one that I've listed here. Okay, so this is how you get the propagators in direct generalization. 
then the next step are the vertices. And I think that probably can fit here. So for the vertices, we start with one term in the interaction Lagrangian, uh, which would be maybe at minus g times a product of some field operators, phi i, phi j, phi k, as an example. So in general, an interaction Lagrangian is a sum of many terms, and each term gives rise to one Feynman rule. So uh, therefore, for term by term, we derive how the Feynman rules look like. And here we consider exactly one such term, which is in this case a product of three field operators times a number valued coefficient. Okay, so g should be a number, and these are scalar field or fermion or vector field operators, uh, and I just labels generally the indices. If you have this term, then you get a Feynman rule which looks like this. Namely, we saw that uh, from the derivation, for each interaction Lagrangian in this exponential function, you get a dot in the Feynman diagram. And at, at the dot, uh, you connect several lines. Namely, for each field operator, the dot connects to one particular line. So the dot uh, connects to a line uh, with phi i, a line with phi j, and a line with phi k in this particular case. And uh, then in the Feynman diagram next to this, there might be propagators for those fields and so on, but the vertex connects to those three fields. And the rule is um, minus i times g. Where does the i come from? The i comes from e to the i times interaction Lagrangian in the exponential function for the S matrix. That explains the i. And the minus g is the prefactor in front of the field operators. So the general rule is the following. We have a connecting line for each uh, field and the coefficient can be written as i times and then the derivative of the interaction Lagrangian with respect to all those fields. Okay. In this way you would get here the minus g times i gives minus i times g. This one. Okay, uh, questions to this rule? Yeah. The interaction assumption has a term written for one more field, let's say if I have a field, then this part of the derivative would give I P plus the coefficient that we previously had in front of minus G. So what is this phi you are mentioning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And additional one with four fields. Yes. Then the coefficient, as you have said, is just a partial distribution. With respect to all the fields that you have in the vertex. Yeah, and then but when you take the partial derivative, the three field term simply becomes a constant. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Uh, you always have to take the derivative with respect to the respective fields which appear in the appropriate term. If you have a term with four fields, then you have to take a derivative with respect to exactly those four fields. Yeah, I was just thinking whether we had to cover with this definition if we had multiple number of fields appearing. Now you always take as many derivatives as you need until you get a constant. So for each field in the Lagrangian, you get a line, connecting line for each field. And then you need to take a derivative with respect to all those fields corresponding to all the lines. So if you have a vertex with four fields, 
then you take four derivatives and then of course you also get a constant. And the vertex looks like this, right? So you will always get a constant. Um, but may, uh, you may be thinking also of symmetry factors because if you have something like phi to the four, for example, and you take the fourth derivative, you will get a symmetry factor as well, four factorial in this case. But that was maybe not your question. So, but it's, It always makes sense if you say that you always take the correct derivative with respect to the correct set of fields. So in this case, let's say the interaction Lagrangian is this times lambda. Okay, that, okay. Then the rule is, first of all, the graphical rule is that at this vertex you have four lines. Why four lines? Because you have here four powers of fields and exactly each line corresponds to one field and you can literally uh, write down a field symbol at each line corresponding to that and then the vertex rule for this um, is defined by taking the fourth derivative with respect uh, to this field because you have four phi lines so you take the fourth derivative with respect to phi and then in this case you will get four factorial times lambda and then that would be your rule. Okay, so you, the rule always makes sense, but uh, here there is an additional subtlety appearing, namely the symmetry factor four factorial. And we will talk about that also in a few moments. And if we had five, four plus five, 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 then your list, your Feynman diagram table, looks like this. That is now your Feynman diagram table corresponding to this interaction Lagrangian. For each term in the interaction Lagrangian, you get one rule. If you have two terms, you get two rules. And for each rule, uh, uh, for each term, you get a rule coming from this recipe. And then for each term is different. So it's, uh, the Lagrangian must be considered as a linear combination of monomials. A monomial is something which does not involve a sum, but only a product of fields and number valued coefficients. That is a monomial. And so for each monomial, for each term in the Lagrangian, you get one rule. And sometimes this uh, recipe here gives you a symmetry factor and we will talk about this in a second. Uh, but before we talk about the symmetry factor, I wanted to talk about vertices with uh, derivatives. So let's suppose you have an interaction Lagrangian that looks like this. Um, for example, g times a mu times phi times i times d mu phi. Okay. Well, i times d mu phi. So you have a derivative in your interaction Lagrangian. Uh, remember, I allowed uh, derivatives in the interactions. And so here is a simple example. Uh, of course, this thing has a Lorentz index and in order to make it Lorentz invariant, we can multiply it with a photon field, a mu here. Let us not worry about gauge invariance, but uh, let's just look at this Lorentz invariant term. Okay, so what is the Feynman rule corresponding to this term? So the rule here is not sufficient, but the rule uh, is as follows, namely, um, Remember that we always do Fourier transformations and I times d mu becomes the incoming momentum flowing into a field. Therefore, in Fourier space, this I times d mu becomes the incoming momentum flowing into this field operator phi here. Therefore, the rule is the following. So for this particular example, we have a rule with, um, so let's say, 
phi 1 and phi 2. We have a rule with one photon field. We have a phi 1 field and a phi 2 field in the vertex. Okay. And uh, so three lines connect at the dot. Now what is the um, value of the vertex in Fourier space? First of all, we get the i from the exponential e to the i times the Lagrangian. Then we get the g from here. And then we get the momentum from the Fourier transformation of the derivative. And this is the incoming momentum flowing into the field operator phi 2. Therefore, here in this, we have to write down what is the momentum flowing into this field phi 2. Let's call it k or k2 to be uh, maybe more explicit. k2 and then the rule is that k2 mu. So in the Feynman rule, contains a Lorentz index, uh, which uh, corresponds to the Lorentz index of the photon field operator here. So that is the rule. So I times D becomes the momentum P incoming into the appropriate field operator. And so in this way, you can derive the Feynman rules also for derivatives, and then you have the full possibility to derive all Feynman rules for all cases. So this is the way how you derive from any quantum field theory uh, the propagators and the vertices. And this is basically the only thing that changes compared to QED. All the rest is the same as in QED. And so I will now make a list with uh, some statements which are kind of uh, maybe a little bit boring, but I want to write it down in a coherent way such that we get a full list of Feynman rules, what you need to do if you want to evaluate in any theory, any Feynman diagram. Let's collect it here. But uh, the rest is now not uh, surprising anymore. So first of all, in a Feynman diagram for the S matrix, we also have external lines, and they are the same as in QED. External lines, they are S in QED. So for um, vector fields, you get those polarization vectors, epsilon mu. For um, fermions with spin one half, you get uh, the u, u bar, v, v bar spinors in the same way as you do for QED. The only thing that we did not yet discuss are scalar fields. But uh, the corresponding thing to the u and epsilon for scalars is just the number one. There is no such factors in the case of scalar fields. Factor one in the field operator where you have the U for the fermion field, you have simply nothing in the case of a scalar field. So that is simple. And then for the S matrix, we have the following rule. S, Fi for a process, uh, initial state going to final state, we write it as Kronecker delta Fi plus I times momentum conserving delta function, sum of the incoming momenta minus sum of the outgoing momenta times TFI. And the TFI is the interesting object. And this I times TFI, this is the sum of all Feynman diagrams. So, and now let me write down a list of uh, rules how you get all the Feynman diagrams. All the Feynman diagrams are obtained by combining the Feynman rules that we have listed on the two blackboards in the following kind of obvious way. But as I said, let me just write it down in a coherent way. So the incoming or outgoing lines they correspond, of course, to the particles in your process. You have as many incoming and outgoing lines as you have particles in your process. So we can say they correspond to the states I and F to the initial state and the final state of your process. 
then the rules for the propagators, which are the internal lines and vertices, they are as above. So these are the sets of rules that apply to the vertices and um, propagator. And then the Feynman diagrams are of course obtained by connecting all the vertices and all in um, external lines in all possible ways. Connect the external lines with vertices in all possible ways. And each diagram then corresponds to a certain contraction. And uh, just to remind you, the contractions are obtained in this schematic way. You take the final state and the initial state and in between you have the time ordered exponential function of i times the integral over the interaction Lagrangian density. Okay. And so you, you replace final and initial states by creation and annihilation operators and then you have an expression that you can evaluate step by step in perturbation theory using contractions and there is this correspondence between the diagrams and this here. And if you are in doubt what the correct Feynman diagrams are, it's always correct to go back to this expression and to evaluate symmetry factors minus signs or whatever. Or to check whether you have uh, forgotten diagrams or something like this. Then the um, symmetry factors. So the 1 over n factorial from the exponential and also factors um, from these derivatives that we have mentioned, the L int derivative by with respect to phi. There, there can be symmetry factors as well like this four factorial in the example. They typically <coughs> cancel. but not always. And uh, therefore one has to do a case by case analysis of those symmetry factors. But uh, for example in QED it is rather rare that you get uh, non-trivial symmetry factors and that you need to take into account anything. But um, in other theories, it happens more frequently. In particular, in such a theory where you have such a field and such a vertex, phi to the four, where you get this four factorial, there you often encounter such symmetry factors and not completely cancelled uh, four factorial factors and so on. So, but this is just a general statement here. Then there are the minus signs, relative minus one possible in case of fermions. And at each vertex we have four momentum conservation. And for loop diagrams, the integral over this undefined loop momentum remains. Right. So this ends the main set of rules. And uh, what is left is only one remark. But before I do the remark, let me give you again the chance to ask questions. This would be the uh, complete list of rules for general Feynman diagrams for any theory. 
for the S matrix. And remember in the videos, you can also see Feynman diagrams for green functions, which are similar, but not exactly identical. So if there are no questions, then let me do the remark, which is technical. Namely, the point is that uh, the rules here are correct, but the derivation is not in all cases as simple as in the case of uh, our example for QED. In some cases, in some theories, uh, obtaining those simple rules uh, involves certain tricks. And uh, let me write this down. The rules for derivative interactions and vector field propagators uh, they do not directly follow from our procedure. But there is a, a cancellation. So we have actually several issues at several places. There are some problems with our procedure. Mm. Namely, let me maybe, uh, since we have 10 minutes of time, let me indicate the problems. Uh, problem one is uh, the Hamiltonian density is not always equal to minus the interaction Lagrangian density. That is not always true. Uh, but we have assumed this to be true in our derivation because initially our derivation led to an exponential function here for time dependent perturbation theory where in the exponent of course there is the Hamiltonian because the Hamiltonian generates time evolution. But then we simply said, ah, okay, normally uh, this is true and we replace the Hamiltonian by the Lagrangian density. Good, but it's not always true. For example, it is not true if uh, the interactions involve time derivatives and it is also not always true if you have vector fields. It's actually true for the photon, but for example, for the W boson or for um, simplified uh, massive vector fields, it might not be um, true, this statement here. And then we have a problem at this point. And then the point is that the Lagrangian is Lorentz invariant, whereas the Hamiltonian is not Lorentz invariant. So we have something non-Lorentz invariant replaced by something which is Lorentz invariant. So that is the first problem. The second problem is that, for example here, in the derivation from our procedure, we would of course get this here, or we would also get uh, this sort of thing. Okay. Uh, this is a contraction. If we have derivative interactions, it will happen that we get a derivative of a field in a time ordered expectation value. And uh, then, in the formalism that we are using, this is not automatically equal to, let's say, the out, outer derivative of this expectation value. Okay, so this is not necessarily equal. And uh, the difference between those two expressions is that this is, of course, Lorentz invariant because uh, the expectation value is Lorentz invariant and its derivative is of course also Lorentz covariant, uh, but this is not because of the time ordering of time derivatives. It's not Lorentz invariant. So we have a non-Lorentz invariant expression here and also in the case of massive fields, uh, this is not Lorentz invariant or covariant. if you have a massive vector field and you quantize it in the way we did in our chapter two of the lecture, then this expression can be evaluated 
from everything that we have um, uh, discussed, and the result is just not Lorentz invariant or covariant. Okay, so this is uh, uh, also a problem. And uh, however, uh, the point is all these problems cancel. So that means if you ignore everything simultaneously, then uh, the procedure is correct. That means uh, the non-Lorentz invariant uh, term here in this transition cancels exactly the non-Lorentz invariant terms appearing in those um, time-ordered expectation values. And therefore, if you ignore everything, then um, it's correct. Ah, okay, and the third problem, let me add this. Uh, uh, this propagator is not the inverse of the corresponding differential operator. Yes, that would be Lorentz invariant. So the differential operator is of course Lorentz covariant and so its inverse is also covariant. But this is not covariant and therefore it's not the same. And so if you ignore all these difficulties, then uh, they cancel among each other and the rules that I've already stated are completely correct. The only question is, uh, uh, what is the best way to derive the correct rules also in those cases? Now we have basically obtained them from analogy to QED. In QED, those problems don't exist. And I simply claim that uh, those rules are always true. And I want to make you aware of the subtleties here. And uh, so in that sense, it's an advertisement for the quantum field theory two lecture where one can do the path integral derivation of Feynman rules, which is a derivation which manifestly, directly, automatically leads to those rules and which avoids all these problems. And uh, therefore, this is also a proof that indeed all these problems cancel. But if you uh, want to do this in the context of this operator canonical quantization, then you really need to sit down and figure out all those non-Lorentz invariant terms and check that they indeed cancel out. And the fact that they cancel is of course a reflection of the fact that the underlying theory is indeed Lorentz invariant. It's Lorentz invariant by construction because it comes from a Lorentz invariant Lagrangian which is quantized. Therefore, there, there is no reason at all for the uh, final theory to be not Lorentz invariant. It is Lorentz invariant. And therefore, those subtleties, they are a reflection of the fact that the Hamiltonian formalism singles out time and uh, therefore breaks Lorentz invariant or doesn't treat Lorentz invariance in a manifest way. And therefore, you get some subtleties which in the end cancel out. So it's a drawback of using the Hamiltonian formalism. And the path integral is a formalism which is built to manifestly preserve Lorentz covariance. And therefore, in this approach, all these problems do not appear. Okay, but uh, the statement remains that those set of rules here are um, correct in even those cases. And uh, just to reiterate, for QED, these subtleties are not existing. For QED, uh, our derivation completely uh, directly leads to the correct rules without any detour. All right. I think then we can stop. And uh, tomorrow we will go on with a new chapter. So we have now um, enabled ourselves to calculate Feynman diagrams and therefore uh, calculate processes. And so now we will um, look at QED more seriously, also from the physics point of view, and we will uh, calculate Feynman diagrams, but not only to understand Feynman rules, but to really study the quantum field theory and uh, predictions of QED and what is the impact of um, the quantization of the photon field and the electron field. And uh, depending on how we proceed, we might also come to the context of one loop calculations in QED in this semester so that you also see this um, um, arising of higher order effects which um, 
give rise to interesting new phenomena. Okay, so this is the plan which we will begin with tomorrow. See you then.